Well, hi, welcome to my latest video. Well, on this one, I'm going to be talking about SATA ports. Those are the ports on your motherboard that allow you to connect up external drives. Not the M2 drives, I'll talk about those probably in a future video, but the drives that you have to connect up through a cable. For example, through a SATA cable. Your motherboard comes with a couple of these, and every motherboard has some SATA ports on it today. Mine that I'm going to use for this particular build, which is a network attached storage device, only has four SATA ports on it, which is not enough because I want to put eight drives on the PC. In addition, I need a couple of more drives just to hold the operating system, and I want to do it in a redundant fashion, so I need two additional ports. So eight drives two operating system drives, that means that I have to be able to support a total of 10 SATA ports. So what can I do? Well, I found this card that's a PCIe card. Now, I've used these before. I had an older PC that did not have higher speed SATA, which is called SATA 3. It had only SATA 2, which runs at half the performance level. So I added a two-port card to that, and I'll put the video up for that uh, uh, and at the end of this video so you can watch it if you're interested in how I got that to work and how well it worked. But this is more important because that replaced the two SATA 2 with SATA 3 connectors. Okay? These are all SATA 3. The problem is that those drivers only work with Windows. And my NAS is going to be running a different operating system. It'll be running either FreeBSD or possibly Linux, one of the variant builds of Linux that are out there, and uh, that will not run on this. So, even though it tested okay, I had to go and look for another choice. And what I found was this one here. Now this one only supports six SATA ports, but that's what I need. I need six more SATA ports in order to support what I want to support on my new network attached storage. The big advantage of this one is no drivers required. And it's listed in the, the advertisement, um, as I'll put a pointer to at the bottom of this uh, video, as being able to support that many drives without any sort of driver and work on many different operating systems. I think including not only the Linux and the FreeBSD, but also ESSI and a few other operating systems that it supports. So that's pretty impressive. But I have to test it, which is what I'm going to do later in this video. I'm going to take one of my test benches out that has a similar motherboard to what I'll be putting this on, and I'll put this in there and we'll test it out. We'll not only test it for functionality, but we'll test it for performance, okay? Now, with that, I want to go next into SATA cables. The reason I want to mention that is I've got quite a few questions uh, on some previous videos of mine. What is a good SATA cable? What is a bad SATA cable? What is the difference between the different color SATA cables? Well, let me just start right off by saying the color doesn't matter. I've seen SATA cables in black, in red, in blue. I even saw one in somebody else's PC as like yellow, and I thought it saw a green too in that same video. But it doesn't matter. SATA cables also are straight through. I believe they're eight wires contained within the cable itself. This particular one is, uh, my guess, about 14 inches. And that's the important thing to keep note of. One of the important things. How long is it? Will it reach from where you want to go from your motherboard to the device? And, you know, will it be able to do wire management properly with it as a result? But the other thing that's important is does it have locking tabs or not? This particular one, which came with one of my motherboards, actually has two connectors on it. One is a 90 degree, the other one is a straight through, and it has locking tabs. So for example, if you looked at this one here, that's on this drive, there is no locking tabs to it. There's nothing to lock it in to the drive itself. So if I put, take this out, it could pop right out pretty easily, especially when you go in and out several times when you're doing testing with these. This one here will actually lock in place onto the motherboard, and that's an important feature to understand. By locking in place, it won't pull out unless you push the little button here to unlock it. Okay, a little tab, metal tab in this case. Sometimes they're plastic, sometimes they're metal. I like the metal ones. 
If you look at this cable also, it's quite short. So if I take this cable and I connect it up to this drive, for example, let's see here. You can actually hear the snap of it when I lock it in place. Okay? And it will not come out unless I push that little metal tab down. Like that. Okay? So that's an important feature. So those features, how long they are and whether or not they have a locking tab is all that matters. You can pick whatever color you want. Over here I have a reds, I have some blacks, and downstairs I have some white ones even that I used in special builds like that one down there that are all white and I wanted the cables not to stand out as a funny color, okay? Now the next thing I'm gonna talk about is throughput. Now these cards are interesting because they're gonna connect up to your PCIe connections on your, on your motherboard. This particular one, if you look at the lands to it, it's actually only going to fit in what we call an X4 slot. They do have them in X1. For example, I saw this exact same one with 10 and even 12 ports on it for X1, right? This happens to be X4, but the problem with this one is it has a secondary chip on it that allows it to potentially throttle between the SATA connections, between the, the SATA uh, support connections that are on the chip, the main chip that's on there, which I think is an ASM 1166. I'll put a, a little symbol up on the screen here to show exactly what that is. Now, if you put it into a system that uh, you only use six of the ports on it, it probably will work fine. It doesn't have to throttle between them. And that's a chart that I want to show you here that I came up with. Did some research and I have three versions of it here. I'll show the first one, which is the base unit of it. And I show going far, as far back as the PCIe standard 2.0. Now, you're not going to find it anywhere anymore, but I wanted to show in reference perspective how it has doubled almost with every new PCI version that has come out. So when it went from 2.0 to 3.0, the performance on the PCIe doubled, the throughput doubled. When it went from three to four, it doubled again. When it went from four to five, it doubled yet again. And I heard they're working on a six. My guess is it'll double again, but we'll see. But this chart shows uh, how much actual throughput you're gonna get on each of the slots on your PCIe. So if you use a PCIe X.1, and you are, let's say, PCIe version 3, that says that we will have a total throughput of 0 0.980 gigabytes per second throughput. Okay, that's an important thing to understand because I added an extra column that I labeled, in this case, S3P, which stands for SATA 3, the higher version of SATA 3 in terms of throughput, performance. And I did the math in each case here showing how many maximum throughput SATA ports you can get out of that PCIe slot. So for example, if you looked at version 3, PCIe X.1, you only get 1.6 at full throughput. If, however, you get a card that can go either into a PCIe version 4 slot, or you go up the actual PCIe standard that you're using, the different slots, then you pick up more performance. So for purposes of this six port one that I'll be using on my NAS, well, let's look that one up. That one has PCIe version three. It's going to be using, as it has to use, it won't fit into an X.1 slot, it's going to be using an X4 slot, which means that if you do the math, it comes out to 6.6 .6 SATA devices will run at maximum speed without any throttling, without any secondary chip having to share the bandwidth. Now it's unlikely with SATA anyway that you're gonna be using the maximum bandwidth all the time for all of the SATA ports. So it's unlikely you know, that's gonna make that much of a difference for most people. However, if you were running a diagnostic where all the ports were hit simultaneously, trying to see what they do at maximum capability, then you will see they will not run at this advertise 600 gigabytes per second on all the ports. Some of them will be slower, maybe all of them will be slower depending on how the throttling 
and the sharing of the throughput takes place on that particular card. For example, this other one that has so many ports on it, total of, of eight ports on it, rather than the six that this one has. Okay, so I wanted to cover that and give you an idea of why I picked that one. And the important thing is, for me, that it doesn't need drivers, which means that I can put it on any operating system because the actual system recognizes that card, or at least I believe it does. So the motherboard should be able to recognize it, and the um, operating system should also recognize it, and I'll test that out along with a little test of throughput as well to a couple of uh, SATA SSDs. Okay, so let's move on to that now. Okay, what you see here is I've taken my Intel test bench. It has an 8th gen CPU on it, and I've inserted SATA controller into the second time 16 slot. I have no video card in here. I'm using the motherboard video, so I don't have to worry about that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to power this on and jump into the BIOS. Okay, there we go. And I'm going to go straight to the peripherals. And then I'm going to go into something called the offboard SATA controller configuration. And we see it. We see that a controller has been added. It's using PCI bus six. Let's see if it has any devices on it. And sure enough, I have two devices connected to it, which you will see right over here on the blowout of the camera looking down these two SSDs that are connected to it. So the BIOS actually recognizes it. And uh, if it recognizes the BIOS, chances are the Windows will recognize it as well. So let me go ahead and do a save and exit. I will tell it to save and exit setup. Yes, let's save it. And now we should jump into Windows, hopefully. Oh, and there it goes, the Windows wheel is turning. So we have a pretty good chance of that happening at this point. And there we go, we're in Windows. Let me log in. There we go. I'm going to go into the device manager. That's already, I looked at it recently, so let me click on that. Let's take a look at the devices. Now those two drives are already formatted before I put them on. So we can actually see if it sees disk drives. And sure enough, we see two T-Force 256 gigabyte drives. Okay, so and that pretty much proves that it does work. It's recognized by both the BIOS and Windows itself, which is a good thing. If I go to controllers, I'll probably see the controllers listed. And there we are. We now see two standard SATA controllers, a device for each of the controllers, the one built onto the motherboard and the new one that I added. So this works. Uh, if I open up my drives, let's see what I have. This PC. And there we are. We have two new drives. I've actually named them before I put them on here. One is SSD 200 and 56-1 and another one, 256-2. They are drives F and E on this PC.